John chapter 1. You know, playing sports uh, so many years in high school and college and even professionally, uh, I would go uh, to, to play ball. Uh, I'd have a fever. I'd be sick. I'd be stomach flu, whatever it was. I wouldn't miss a game, wouldn't miss a practice. And I've tried to keep that in through uh, in preaching and serving God and as well. Of course, I haven't had a, a fever through this last several days, but uh, we certainly thank God for the privilege to be able to serve our Savior. Sometimes we're healthy. Sometimes we're not as healthy as we'd like to be. Sometimes our voice is strong. Sometimes it's not as strong as we'd like it to be. But uh, we're here tonight, and I want to thank you for your faithfulness. We've had a great, great day today. We had to make a lot of adjustments. A lot of folks that are out this, uh, this weekend and a lot of our church family, and we uh, want to be sure to be in prayer for them. Don't want to mention them specifically because I'd miss some, but we've got a lot that are homesick. We want to pray that God will touch our bodies. I did have a follow-up phone call uh, for Sister Ushri today, and uh, it looks like they both have COVID, so we want to pray that God will give them a good, quick recovery. They've got some of the uh, things that they're taking with their butyrol and, and the inhaler and different things. So just pray that God will give them good strength. Also talk to Brother Wiley, and uh, he's home recuperating well, feeling good from his surgery on Friday. And he has a follow-up doctor appointment this Friday uh, with the doctor. And so he's not able to lift or anything for the next uh, couple of weeks. And so uh, you pray for them to continue to heal and to progress. John chapter number one, John chapter one, let's all stand tonight, please, in honor and respect to the reading of God's words. I know we we're just standing for singing, but let's look at this verse here, <clears throat> the gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, look with me, if you would, beginning in verse number six. The Bible says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, notice the light is capitalized there in your Bible, referencing Jesus Christ, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light. Again, capital L there referring to Jesus. John the Baptist, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, again capitalized, which lighteth every man that cometh in the world. He was in the world. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. Heavenly Father, I pray you, Nick, the few moments that we have together and we allow the Bible, uh, Lord, to do a great work in our hearts and minds. Lord, give us a tent of hearts, a tent of minds. Help us to learn and grow and be a better child of servant of you, Lord, because of tonight. Strengthen my voice this evening, Father, that it could be a help and uh, that we can hear the words of God that will strengthen our faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Lord, bless now t tonight, please, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated, if you would, please. Several years ago, uh, Brother Nathan and I had the privilege. Uh, we had never uh, been bird hunting before. I know, uh, Brother Pacheco, you've done some uh, bird hunting, chuck, chucker hunting and, and things of that nature. And uh, we were able to um, go, uh, my um, uh, cousin had, uh, in Woodland, California, had a, a pass uh, to where they put in and they pay so much for this um, uh, location that they went to, hunting place, and you could go get pheasants and quail and, and all kinds of different birds. And, and they were coming to the end of their season. They only had a couple more weeks to go, and they had a bunch of, of pheasants and a bunch of quail and a bunch of different birds that they still were allotted that they had paid for for that year. And uh, they invited uh, Brother Nathan and I to go and be a part of that. Brother Nathan at that time, I don't know, he was probably... Uh, uh, maybe junior high, maybe early high school years. But he was just a young, young fellow. And we were able to go and and uh, and we got our fill. We got all their birds that they needed. I think pretty much, and we had a great time uh, shooting there with a the shotgun, going through. And they go. It's interesting. Uh, they'll take the birds out ahead of time, and uh, they've got them in in the bins, and they'll they'll spin them. And then they'll, they'll put them inside of a sagebrush or inside of some kind of grass. And because they spun them, they're dizzy and they just stay right in there. And so your job is then to go out in these hundreds of acres of, um, of, of land and try to find them and then shoot them and be able to. And, it's, and they had hundreds of acres that was there. Uh, but my cousin, he had a, um, a dog that he was just training, a pointer dog that he was training. And there was another older gentleman that went with us that had a veteran pointer dog. And it was amazing to me, and I don't know if uh, you've ever seen or been a part of that. We had never been a part of that until that event uh, in going out that pointer dog. It was an amazing thing to watch that English pointer uh, known as a gun dog. 
and uh, they don't budge when you shoot a gun. They're right there. They're, st they're steady, and they're not spooked by guns. And, and so they'll come to that, uh, that bird, and they'll find them, and they, 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 they stiffen their body and in such a way with their tail and their, their legs and the way they point and their, their name, the very thing that they do, they point uh, in that direction of where that bird is. And uh, this dog that was the older gentleman's dog that was training this other dog, uh, it was an amazing thing. I mean, he would go and, boy, they'd snoop and they'd have a great time going and running. But as soon as they caught the scent of some bird, they would, they would make a beeline towards that direction and they would just stop and they'd be a distance or so, maybe from, uh, maybe from here to the, the back seat of the choir seat here, not, you know, maybe eight or ten feet from there. They'd just stop and point that direction. And oftentimes we'd go in there and look and there we didn't see anything at all. And then they'd go spook it and then the bird would fly. And uh, the objective was to let it get at least five foot off the ground before you shot it. Right, Brother Pacheco? Yeah, and that's the way you got to give them a little head start. And, and so get, they get up in the air and then uh, you shoot them. We lost a couple. They went over the, the property line, you know, and, of course, they got a pheasant, uh, got away. But the pointer dog is interesting. The pointer name comes from the dog's most distinctive signature trade, pointing. When a pointer spots a prey or within a domestic setting, something else of interest, such as the approach of someone that they may know, they take on their signature pointing pose, in which their whole body becomes rigid with energy, and the shape and direction of their body literally points to the thing that they are looking to. And I'd like to take that thought of a pointer dog and uh, the success of that dog uh, was not like most dogs where they would go and they would capture the prey themselves. And uh, many dogs are very aggressive, and if they see a bird, they'll go get it and bring it back to you. But it wasn't that type of a dog. They didn't find their thrill uh, in capturing uh, the bird. They found their thrill. They were a success as, a, as a, their job. If they would find the, the bird, point the owner to where the bird was, and then the owner was then able to focus their attention, shoot that bird, and the success of that dog was not in capturing the bird, but allowing the owner to capture the bird. We see that said about John the Baptist. It says, there was a man uh, that was sent from God whose name was John. And so John the Apostle is describing John the Baptist. Okay, and so sometimes we get that mixed up here a little bit. But the Apostle John is different than John the Baptist. And so he's, he's referencing this man that says was sent from God whose name was John. And then the Bible says the same came, this man came, for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. And so his primary purpose in life was that others could come to know Christ through him. It wasn't him that it wasn't him that was the focal point. It was through him who Jesus would then be focused upon, others would be focused upon in Jesus Christ. And that's why it says he was not that light. John the Baptist was not that light, but was sent to what? Bear witness of that light. And so John admitted uh, his humble identity. His success was not found in his accomplishments. His success was found in pointing men to Jesus. And I want to take that thought of a pointer dog, or John the Baptist, as that pointer uh, that came as the forerunner of Christ, uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and he found his mission in life, his purpose in life, his ultimate objective of life. Uh, he knew what his identity was, and that identity, his sole purpose, was to make much of Jesus. That was his job. And I want to encourage each of us as we learn about John the Baptist tonight that that also would be our sole purpose in life. It's not about us. It's not about what I've done. It's not about what you've done. It's not about what we've accomplished. It's not about what our plans are. It's not about what our goals are. It's not about what we can do. It's all about making much of him. And so if we can live life and be a pointer dog or a John the Baptist that would point others through whom they can see the light, through whom they can come to know Jesus, through whom they can see the greatness of the God that we serve, through whom they can see the greatness of the God that, uh, that we serve and allow them to know that Savior, then we have been a success in our Christian life. You can build a business and be a failure but if you don't point folks to Christ. Uh, you can have a great uh, uh, things that you've accumulated 
in life. But if you've not lived your life to point people to Christ, then really we've not fulfilled our purpose as a pointer dog for Jesus, as John the Baptist only wanted to do was find a soul for Christ and then point them to Jesus Christ. Point them to the one who can help solve and help their problems. And so as we look at this man, John the Baptist, I'm going to give us several uh, statements that I think hopefully will be a help to us as we look at this thing of, of uh, being that pointer dog uh, for Jesus. Number one, let me give you this thought. When Jesus increased, let me give you a cross-reverence here first. Go to John chapter 3 because it jumps around a little bit. Also in the, the various gospels we'll look at. But look in John chapter 3 verse 27 down through verse uh, number 30. And then we'll look at several the verses in between from chapter 1 to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 27, John answered and said, John the Baptist, now a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. So John the Baptist, he knew what his identity was. I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. It's not about me. I'm not the one that can help your life. I'm not the one that can fix your marriage. I'm not the one that can bring back the prodigal child. There's nothing I can do. I'm not the Christ, he said. And he said, I've told you that before time. He said, I, I told you that, uh, that I'm sent from him, uh, before him. He that hath the bride, he says in the verse, is the bridegroom. And, uh, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. And that was John the Baptist's motto for life. He must increase, and I must decrease. And so as we look at this thought of de it decreasing ourselves so Christ can be increased, let me give you this first thought. Number one, when Jesus increases, life's purpose is defined. When Jesus increases, life's purpose is defined. See, the apostle John introduced John the Baptist simply as a man sent from God whose name was John. Doesn't sound very attractive, doesn't sound very inviting, doesn't seem like it's someone we got on the billboards that let's come and see John. It's just there was a certain man and uh, he was sent from God and his name was John. Luke gives us a little bit more background, the Gospel of Luke, including the miraculous intervention by God to bring about his birth. His mom and dad were very up in years, very uh, elderly when he was uh, brought uh, into existence, and uh, God did that as a miracle. In fact, he is Jesus' cousin. Cousin. And John the Baptist's mother and Jesus' mother uh, were sisters. And so they were cousins. G uh, John the Baptist was born about six months earlier than Jesus. And so they were very close. Um, and uh, they would eventually they would have a very good relationship uh, as uh, they would grow up together. And so we see John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus. Uh, he was a forerunner for Jesus, the king, a herald. A voice is all he was. The Bible says a voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way uh, as it was prophesied. 700 years before John the Baptist showed up, John the Baptist was prophesied as being the one that would be the voice pointing others to Jesus Christ. It wasn't about John the Baptist. It was about his job in making way, making preparation, uh, or being that voice for the Son of God that was about to come. John the Baptist undoubtedly was a great man of God. In fact, Jesus testified of his greatness. Take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter number 11. And look what Jesus himself said of his cousin, his, his older cousin, as he describes uh, the character qualities of, of this man uh, called that John the Baptist. Uh, we see in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, Verily I say unto you, notice Jesus what he says as he testifies the greatness of John the Baptist, Matthew 11, 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the the Baptist. Wow. I mean, this is Jesus saying of all that have been born, uh, there's been none born of woman that's greater than John the Baptist. And uh, so this was a man that no doubt undoubtedly was a great man of God. And it goes on to say of Jesus said of him, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And so John was a great man of influence, a great man of authority, very popular, a man of honor. And when Jesus began, or when he began his ministry, preaching in the wilderness, multitudes followed him. 
Uh, the Bible says he was a very unusual man. Uh, he would eat uh, locusts and wild honey. And, uh, and the, that was his diet. And, I mean, he was a mountain man and, and uh, would wear uh, garments that were maybe not the normal garments and, and uh, would sleep on, on the outside and use a rock as a pillow. And, and so just a mountain man, but there was that voice crying in the wilderness and a great man. But the Bible tells, let's look at Matthew chapter 3. Jump over there if you're in Matthew 11. Go to Matthew 3. Uh, we see multitudes of people followed him and re- <coughs> excuse me, responded positively to him and followed him. By the droves, Matthew 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him, John the Baptist, in Jordan, confessing their sins. I mean, people were coming from Jerusalem. They were coming from all of Judea. They were coming from all the region about Jordan. Where? They were coming to hear this man of God preach, the voice crying in the wilderness. Uh, Folks were getting saved and baptized and getting right with God and homes getting reconciled. John the Baptist... He had a great, great uh, the results of his stand for God. However, John the Baptist knew his ministry was not in the ministry of, 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 of prevent, presenting himself to himself, but to Christ. John spent his entire life preparing the way for Jesus. John 1, 23 says, he said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And so John the Baptist recognized his own insignificant when placed next to Jesus, and he embraced it. He wasn't worried about competing against Jesus. He wasn't worried about being the limelight of Jesus. He embraced his position of being the preparer, the one that was the voice, crying in the wilderness, to point men so through him they would know Jesus. That pointer dog for Jesus, that his whole purpose in life, his success in life, was pointing people to Jesus. And he wasn't ashamed of that. He wasn't embarrassed of that. And it wasn't an area of competition for him. Notice in John uh, chapter 1, John chapter 1 and uh, verse number 27 later, it said of John the Baptist uh, in verse 27 of chapter 1 of John, he it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose, uh, the Bible says, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to and lose. I want you to notice several times in John chapter 1 the phrase that's referenced preferred before me. Look in John chapter 1, verse number 15. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. All I've been talking about is this man Jesus. Here he is. He's showing up now. Everything I've preached is about this guy here. Here he is. The Bible says, He that cometh after me is what? Preferred before me. For he was before me. He says, listen, it's not about me, folks. I know you're coming from Jerusalem. I know you're coming from all Judea. I know you're coming from all the region about to hear me preach. But what I'm preaching is this person that's showing up right now. He's preferred more than me. Skip down to verse number 27 of the same chapter of verse number 1. Chapter number 1. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me. Whose shoe latches I'm not worthy to lose. Look in verse number 13. This is he of whom I said... After he cometh the man which is preferred before me, for whom he was before me. Listen, over and over again, John the Baptist said, it's not about me. It's not about what I can accomplish. It's not about what I've done. It's not about the following that I have. It's all about Jesus. He's preferred above me. Listen, he is a pointer dog for Jesus. And God says, I want you and I, as a child of God, our purpose, our life mission, ought to be a pointer dog for Jesus. So it's not about us getting the limelight. We're a success, not because of what we accomplish. We're a success, not because of how many people follow us. We're a success because we point people to Jesus. And through him, they came to believe upon Christ. I wonder tonight, how many through us have trusted Christ as Savior? I mean, how many through us have come to know Jesus as their Savior? I wonder tonight, how many through us are forgiven on their way to heaven? It's through us as a pointer dog for Jesus Christ. And so we see that he must increase, but I must decrease. And so Jesus increases. When he does, we find our life purpose. Our purpose is defined when Jesus is increasing in our lives. He says, I'm not worthy to unloose. Now, in the Bible times, servants would take off the sandals 
of someone that would travel in, and their job was to take off their sandals, wash their feet, and so you can get back on the road again. Much like a shoe shine, maybe in an airport, you show up, and you're waiting for your flight, you got the guys on the bench, and you'll sit up there, and boy, they'll shine your shoes, and so they would come along, and these servants would take off your shoes, wash your feet, get your sandals off, and clean them, put them back on your feet so you can continue your journey. Talk about being humble. When you say, I'm not even worthy to untie someone's sandal, that was huge because that was a servant's job. That was their job to take off someone else's sandals, wash someone else's feet, and uh, prepare those sandals to be placed back on them. He's done the best. I'm not even worthy to even untie someone's sandals as important as Jesus Christ. John realized how lowly he was compared to Jesus Christ. John the Baptist understood what his mission in life was, to prepare a people for the commencement of Jesus' ministry. That's all it was about. It was to be a testimony that would point people to Jesus. It was to live a life that would point people to Jesus. It was to have a marriage that would point people to Jesus. It was to raise a family that would point people to Jesus. It was to live a lifestyle that was to point people to Jesus. All about his life was to be a pointer dog for Jesus, just to point people to Jesus. He was a success, not because of all that he did or all that he accomplished, but because of those through him came to know Christ as Savior. And so that pointer dog for Jesus. And so John needed to increase. John, I'm sorry, Jesus needed to increase. John needed to decrease. John the Baptist was enjoying at this time of his life and ministry the highest level of success in ministry. I mean, he was at the pinnacle. I mean, folks were coming from all around. I mean, he was this, this man of God and this, this servant of God, and they came from all over to hear John the Baptist preach. And so he was at the pinnacle of, uh, of his ministry. But the results of his ministry were at the greatest point, and Jesus, at his time now, was starting his ministry as well. He didn't start until the last three and a half years of his life. Jesus uh, lived a life as a carpenter's son and as a servant of God and just in the back shadows and the back scenes and those last three and a half years he began his ministry. John the Baptist was already well in his way as the ministry and Jesus was just starting off. Jesus the disciples, Jesus' disciples were beginning to see large numbers of people coming from uh, for baptism. In fact there was a switch over that was taking place. Those that were going to John the Baptist for these many months and years prior to this were now switching over and now going over to Jesus to be baptized of him. Notice in chapter 3 of John, verse number 26, when the disciples of John the Baptist had heard and saw that the ministry of John the Baptist was beginning to decline, they were losing some fellowship. They were losing some popularity and influence because this Jesus guy, this Messiah guy uh, was showing up. The disciples of John the Baptist became very angry and upset because all of their people were going to go where Jesus was. Notice what we see here in John, um, in John chapter 1, verse uh, number 29. Look what it says here. John chapter 1, he goes on, he says, he says, where uh, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but uh, that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but that sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Verse 34. And I saw and bare record that this is the Son of God. And uh, I want you to skip down uh, a little bit here. And uh, notice that we, say, we see here, uh, go to another chapter here. Go to chapter number 3. Chapter number 3, verse 25. And there arose a question among some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came unto John and sent him rabbi. That means master or teacher. Uh, he that is with ye beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness. This, this man, they didn't even say his name. He that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness. What did John come to bear witness of? Jesus, the light. 
He was not the light, but he came to bear witness of the light, John 1. He wasn't the Christ, but he came to bear witness of the Christ. And so the disciples of John the Baptist came and said, This fellow that, you, that you're bearing witness of that's on the other side of Jordan, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. They're saying, listen, all of our followers are going that direction. All the folks that were coming to hear you preach are going down to hear him preach. And this isn't fair. This isn't right. We've given our time and our effort and our love and our sacrifice. And now they're leaving and going to be this, this guy that's over on the other side of Jordan, not even saying his name Jesus. And notice John the Baptist's response in verse 27. And John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth, rejoiceth greatly because the bridegroom's voice, this my joy, therefore is fulfilled. He must increase but I must decrease. What's he saying? He says when you go to the wedding, uh, the, the, the best man isn't the focal point. Uh, the, the, the best man uh, isn't the one that gets all the attention. The bridegroom gets the attention. And I'm here to support. And this is the one I preached about. And this is the one I prepared you to prepare to accept in your life. He's the one. He must increase. It's not about our ministry. It's not about what God credit, what credit we have. It's all about God increasing, God getting the credit for all this. And you see, you'll never know your purpose in life. Your purpose in life is defined when God begins to become increased in your life. Because it's not about you. It's about everything you do. Pointing people to Jesus. It's about everything you accomplish. Pointing people to Jesus. If you live a life and don't point people to Jesus, then you fail as a child of God. You're not a pointer dog for Jesus as God has saved you to be. John the Baptist was just a pointer dog for Jesus. That's all he was. Through him, they came to believe on Jesus Christ. Through him, it wasn't about John. It was through John. Through others would come to know Christ as their Savior. And so we see that John the Baptist saw Jesus. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, what did he do? He pointed and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. That's what I've been preaching about all these years. That's what I've been telling you is going to come one of these days. That's why I said is going to forgive your sin. Behold, the pointer dog of Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. That's who we're here for. That's what my purpose in life is for, is to point you to Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist was a success, not because all his followers left, not because uh, his disciples were upset and, and angry that uh, they were dwindling and crowned. He was excited because his sole purpose was to point men to Jesus. Behold, there he is. He's arrived, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so he understood his ultimate purpose in life and your purpose and my purpose as a child of God also. It's not about us. We need to draw uh, people's attention and affection to Christ. We need to make their folks to be on him. It's not about how hard life is going. That's why we can't bellyache and complain and gripe all the time because the focus is upon yourself. That's why we can't feel sorry about yourself. It's just so hard. It's so difficult. I'm barely making it. No, sir. It's all about the good of God and the greatness of God, the awesomeness of God, because if we barely can complain, then the focus is pointing to ourselves, how rough it is, or we can say it's awesome to serve God. What a God we serve, pointing people to Jesus Christ, how awesome God, and that's what John the Baptist did. He pointed people's attention, their affection, the direction of Jesus Christ, and so after John the Baptist had publicly bore witness and testified of Jesus, his disciples were a little bit upset. How tragic, how tragic that such good men, disciples of John the Baptist, how tragic that such good men could lose the focus of ministry. Oh, but the same thing can happen to you and I. We can get so wrapped up in ministry, and we can get so wrapped up in ministry that we forget the purpose. It's not about my bus route. It's not about my sensual class. It's not about my church. It's not about my this or my that. It's about God and pointing people to Jesus. That's the purpose. But these folks were so wrapped up in ministry that they forgot what the ministry was. It was pointing people to Jesus. 
wasn't pointing people that they're so-and-so, brother so-and-so, or their sister so-and-so, or their title, their position. It was about, listen, I want to get out of the way, and let's get folks to Jesus, pointers to Jesus, pointer dogs for Jesus Christ. But how tragic that such good men, godly men, would lose focus of the ministry. But how often do we do the same thing today? It's so easy to get wrapped up in the outward appearance of success, even while doing the work of God. Clearly their focus was on the success of their own ministry, but they had forgot the important aspect of ministry. We're doing this thing, it's, it's not for us. We're doing this thing for Him. It's about Him. Whatsoever you find your hand to do, do it what? With all your might. Not for your praise. Not for your glory. Not for your honor. But for Him. To praise God. To point people to Jesus. Why do you work so hard at the job to point people to Jesus? Why do you keep trusting God when you're going through some hard times to point people to Jesus? Why are you still happy when you're going through some hard times to point people to Jesus? That's your purpose in life is to be a pointer dog for Jesus Christ. To point people, John the Baptist, he says, through him, they'll bear witness of the light. A pointer dog for Jesus Christ. But don't get wrapped up in the ministry that you forget the purpose of the ministry. Fortunately, though, John had a clear focus of his own ministry, even though the disciples had temporarily lost their focus. John immediately addresses their concern about Jesus' now newfound popularity growing greater than theirs. He said, listen, that's what it's all about. That's why we're here. It's about Jesus. It's about focusing on Christ. It's about letting God see the greatness of God in other people's lives. It's not about us. He must increase. We've got to decrease. If I'm increasing, I'm preventing him from increasing. If I'm decreasing, and by the way, what prevents the increase of Christ? I must first decrease. But we must decrease in order for God to increase. And so what a statement. What a spiritual principle to grasp here. Uh, as we look at John chapter 3, verses 27 to 30, he says, Ye yourselves bear me witness. I said unto you, fellas, I'm not the Christ. I told you why I was here. I told you what our purpose in life was, but that I am sent before him. And this is my joy is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. And as John put it, a man can receive nothing, verse 27, except to be given him from heaven. Everything we have is from God. And so our job is to point everything back to him. Everything back to God to be that pointer dog for Jesus Christ. John simply meant that he was fine with change because he had done everything he was supposed to do. And he had succeeded. Those, those followers thought he had failed. He says, fellas, we've not failed. Our whole purpose was to prepare the way. Our whole purpose was to be that forerunner. The whole purpose was to be the voice in the wilderness and to point people to Jesus. And yeah, maybe we didn't reach our goal. and Maybe we didn't think what we accomplished, we didn't accomplish. But listen, in the eyes of God, we're a success. Because through him, John the Baptist, they pointed, they were pointed to the light. And through us, you're pointed to the light. You see, your job is to be a pointer for your family. Uh, your family won't know Christ unless you point them to Christ. It's not about you. It's about them seeing Christ through you. It's about them seeing and being pointed to Christ as a result of your life. John the Baptist, uh, his passionate, passion and goal uh, was to pursue a witness for Christ. should be the same passion and goal that we have for our life. His passion was for Christ to increase in his life, in his home, in his family, in his career, in his business, in his ministry. Every area of his life is pointing people to Jesus. Every area of his life is pointing people to Jesus. And every area of your life is to point people to Jesus. Or we point them to self. And oftentimes we're, we're, we're stumbling over that, and oftentimes we do point them to self. And it's all about us and, and how unfair life is. And, and look what I've accomplished, and look what God, uh, look what, what I've done. And it's not about us, it's all about God. Christ is decreasing in the lives of so many today. He's decreasing in the homes of so many today, in the ministries of many today. Mr. Self is increasing. Mr. Self is waxing stronger. Mr. Self is becoming more and more dominant. John clearly demonstrated. He understood his purpose in life, and his full purpose was what? To point people to Jesus. And you're a success tonight if your life, your home, your marriage, your testimony is pointing folks to Christ. If not, then we're a failure. We're a failure. And so we want to strive to be a pointer dog for Jesus so that we come and when others look to us, they don't see us. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify him. 
Not us. It's not about us. So even when others might have wanted to promote John the Baptist, the disciples of John the Baptist were well-meaning. They loved John the Baptist. And they were saying, you, you deserve a fellowship. You deserve. You worked hard. And you invested in all these people. And, and where are they all going? And uh, John the Baptist says, uh-uh, it's not about me. It's about he must increase and we must decrease. Knowing one's place on a team means that no player can rise above the shoulders of those that support him. As a child of God, we're on a team. And the ultimate goal of that team is to make Jesus look good. It's to point people to Jesus. And when there's bickering and fighting and feuding in the family of God, guess what? That's not pointing people to Jesus. When there's worry and fear and anxiety, that's not pointing folks to Jesus. And when there's uh, jockeying for position and jealousy and this and that, there's not pointing folks to Jesus. Listen, our purpose, our, our objective of life is to be a people of God that join together with a common cause, a common purpose to do what? The very purpose that God's given us, to point people to Him. Because who can make a difference in someone's life? Jesus. We can't make a difference in anybody's life. But Jesus can. And so it's not about, let me tell you how, how, how I do this thing. Or let me tell you what I do. And let me tell you what I did. No, it's all about, let me tell you what Jesus can do in your life. Let me tell you what Jesus can do in your home. Let me tell you what Jesus uh, can do with your, your uh, future. So the real heroes of life, listen to this. The real heroes of life are those who never cross the finish line first. They're the ones who never hit a shot at the buzzer. They're the ones who never have caught the game-winning pass. They're the real heroes of life. Why? Because behind every successful man is a host of successful supporters who've nurtured him to a place of prominence. Now, Christ doesn't need, uh, need us to bring him to a place of prominence, but God's placed us in a position that we're to make him preeminent and we're to point people to Jesus. We're all he has. And if we're not making him look good, who is? If we're not pointing the world to Christ, who is? If we're not making him look awesome, who does? Who's going to do it if we don't do it? It's our job to be a pointer of those others to Jesus Christ. They have a place on the team. They know their place on the team. And the purpose of all of us working together is what? To point someone else to Jesus Christ. That's the purpose. And, and we rejoice. And so I said number one. And that was our longest point. The other ones will be a little bit shorter. I said number one, uh, purpose is uh, if we increase Christ, and when Christ is increased, life's purpose is defined. Let me say number two, when Jesus increases, it shows others that he's the most important, uh, he's the most important in our lives. When Jesus increases, it shows others that he is what is the most important in our lives. It's so easy to get trapped in promoting self rather than God. But when you increase him, you're telling everyone else, he's the most important. He's the most important. He's the most important because he's increasing. It's about him. John the Baptist was to tell others to follow Jesus, not him. You see, in order to do that, John had to decrease. He had to humble himself as a servant, telling others to follow someone else other than himself. That's the only way to accomplish the work that God's called us to do. Like John the Baptist, we got to remember, it's, it's, it's the most important thing is Jesus. The most important solution is Jesus. The most important direction to go is Jesus. And if we're not showing folks in our lives through us, pointing them to the light of Christ, then we have failed. We've dropped the ball. We've not fulfilled the purpose of our lives. We're living a, a life that's not abundant, that's not fulfilling and satisfied. Why? Because my purpose is a point, to point people of Jesus Christ. And if I'm not doing that, then I'm unfulfilled. I'm not reaching the potential that God has. So when Jesus has increased, it shows others who's important, most important in my life. Let me say number three, when Jesus increases, joy increases. Look in John chapter 3. We read it several times already, but verses 29 and 30. When Jesus increases, joy increases. John chapter 3, verse 29 he, hath, he that hath, hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, that's the best man. The friend, that's John the Baptist. The bridegroom is Jesus. The friend of the bridegroom is John the Baptist. So it says, um, uh, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Notice now, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. You see, when, joy, when, when, when Jesus increases, joy increases. And then the next line, he says what? He must increase, 
but I must decrease. So the level of my joy, and joy is not uh, based upon what's going on around about me. It's based upon uh, what's going on within me, my relationship with Christ. And so that joy being fulfilled is based on what? If I get out of the way and I point people to Jesus, and I get out of the way and make much of Jesus, and I get out of the way and exalt Jesus, and I get out of the way and give everybody the focus of Jesus, that's when my joy is fulfilled. That's what life's all about. But when it's about me in the limelight, when it's about me getting credit, when it's about me getting my back patted upon, when it's about me getting all the recognition, then I'll never find fulfillment of joy because joy is not found in what you can do for me. It's found in what? We get others to do for him. And so joy is pointing others. So John uh, the Baptist says, man, my joy is fulfilled. Why? Because my life's focus is to increase Jesus Christ in my life. John the Baptist was able to rejoice because he was never in competition with Jesus. He wanted Jesus to be the utter and completely magnified and glorified through his life. How about you tonight? Uh, are you threatened uh, by the focus that Christ gets in your life? Are you focused about giving the attention uh, to him? Listen, do you want him magnified in every area of your life? If you do, that's a level of joy that you'll enjoy in your life. But there's so many grumpy Christians. Why? They, they, didn't, they were offended because they didn't appreciate what I did. They don't recognize all the effort I put forth. Listen, you're not going to be joy-filled if you need the recognition. You're not going to be joy-filled if you're going to have the focus on you. But joy comes when all the focus is on. It's not about us. It's about him. It's about serving our Savior and pointing others to Jesus Christ. And so are we that way? Are we rejoicing for God to get the glory in our life? Because if we're not careful, we can start beating ourselves up and say, well, why? Well, I'm not getting credit for that. I worked hard. I worked hard. I put in a lot of time. Why didn't anybody notice me? Why aren't they giving me attention? John wasn't worried about the glory. He wasn't worried about the attention. He wasn't worried about that. Why? He said, listen, all oh, it's about Jesus Christ. As a pastor of Last Baptist Church, this isn't my church. I'm the under shepherd. My job as a pastor is to get out of the way and point you to Jesus Christ. It's not to follow me. It's to follow Christ. It's not to submit to me. It's to submit to Christ. And Christ said, listen, the greatness of God is pointing others to Jesus Christ. That's your job. That's our job as a child of God to point everyone to Jesus Christ. Now, hopefully, we're pointing them towards him, not towards something else that would take us away from Christ and away from the things of God. Listen, John the Baptist didn't want the glory. He merely was the best man at the wedding celebration. Maybe you've been at a wedding, and the best man gets all the attention. The best man is trying to you know, focus all on him. And listen, it's not about the best man. It's not about the maid of honor. It's about the bride. It's about the groom. The focus is right there. And John the Baptist says, I'm fine. I'm just in the shadows. I'm not in the limelight. I'm on the back scenes. Why? Because the focus of my success is that all the attention is to the bride and groom. And he said, I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. I want all the attention to be on the bridegroom. And so we need to rejoice. We need to rejoice when God gets the glory because it's his anyway. It's his anyway. Uh, when we are prideful, arrogant, conceited, we want our own glory. We want our own recognition. We want people to look to us. We want people to think how good we are and how wonderful we are. It's not about us. Listen, we walk around with our feelings on our shoulders so easily offended. Why? Because we want it to be about us. It's not about us. Listen, you can't offend a dead person. Uh, you can't uh, hurt the feelings of someone that's crucified with Christ. And I died daily, Paul said. Why? Because it's not about me on the forefront. It's about him. It's about putting Christ on the forefront of our lives. And if I'm out of the way, then he can get the limelight. He can be in the spotlight of our lives. But when we're broken and contrite and humble and we sense our nothingness, then, as John did, then Christ can be increased. So I said Jesus increases. When Jesus increases, it shows others what's most important. It defines our life's purpose. It allows our joy to increase. But let me say next thing. When Jesus increases, jealousy decreases. When Jesus increases, jealousy decreases. You see, when we see someone else blessed, the focus should not be, why did they bless, why did God bless them? The focus, and why didn't God bless me? When someone else is blessed, it should be, boy, isn't God good? Because God's the blesser. 
And all the blessings that anyone receives of us is undeserved. It's the grace of God. It's the mercy of God. We're unworthy of anything that God's ever done for us. And so good things come from God. God loves everybody. No one deserves the grace that any of us receive. God is just as desires to bless you as he is to bless anybody else. And so when he blesses someone, we ought to rejoice in God's goodness to bless someone. Not in why didn't he bless me or why did he bless you. See, the focus is not on him, it's on us. And where there's jealousy, it's about us increasing. It's not about him increasing. But when he increases and we hear about something good happens in someone's life, I say, wow, you got that promotion, you got that new car, you got that new this, not that. Wow, praise the Lord. Isn't God good? We don't, blah, 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 I don't know why that happened to me. Listen, it's about God being pointed to. And we rejoice when one of us are blessed. All of us are blessed. Why? Because God is who we're pointing to. And if God blesses me, we all point to God. If God blesses you, we all point to God. We don't point to each other and say, well, why did he bless you? Why did he bless me? Why does God bless any of us? It's all God. Let's be a pointer dog for Jesus and point people to Jesus Christ. And let's not allow jealousy to dominate our lives. When we include others in the blessings and the credit and we don't exclude others, we're an exclusive, elitist, blessing club when it comes to the glory of God. It all belongs to Him. We're to stay humble, and God blesses the saints of God, and we have an inclusive attitude. Isn't God good? He's blessed us. Maybe He didn't bless me particularly or specifically, but He's blessed us in blessing you. He's blessed us in blessing me, in blessing the rest of us. And so when Jesus increases, jealousy decreases. Let me hurry up. Uh, when Jesus increases, our focus on him increases. When Jesus increases, our focus on him increases. You ever driven? You have. I know you have. Of course, we live in the mountains. But when you drive from a distance, you'll see a mountain. I remember the first time the Grand Tetons, and, and uh, boy, they looked so massive and rugged. And, and, uh, and from a distance, they looked magnificent and huge. But as you got closer and drove those miles and got closer and closer and closer, they just got bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like, wow, these things are huge. It's amazing. And, uh, and so, now, did the mountains get bigger? No, they didn't get bigger. They're as big as they always were, but I just got closer. You see, when the focus is on him, as I said a moment ago, when he increases, our focus on him increases. We see, listen, we don't make God bigger than he is. We begin to see God as big as he is. It's not taking a microscope and taking something small and making it bigger uh, than it really is. It's taking a telescope and seeing something how big it really is, but we don't imagine how big it is. That telescope allows us to take something so big, but it looks so small because it's so far. But that telescope allows us to draw near and see how big it really is. It's not any bigger than it ever was. But that telescope draws the bigness out of what it is. And so I don't make God any bigger than he already is. Uh, but we, by drawing closer to him, allow him to be bigger as our focus on him increases. To some people, God seems to be a little shriveled up, impotent God who can scarcely be expected to do anything. The reason for this is that people are living too far away from God. That's why God says, draw nigh to me. How draw nigh to you. You want to see the bigness of God, you've got to decrease. It's not about you. It's not about how big you are. It's not about what you've accomplished. Draw nigh to God. Get close to God. Get near to God. And you'll begin to realize how awesome he is, how big he is, and how insignificant and little and unimportant we are. When we get in the presence of that holy God in the greatness of who he is. And so whatever you focus on naturally grows bigger. You focus on your problems, naturally they're going to get bigger than they really are. You've heard the statement, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. You know, you're, you're making that bigger than it really is. And why? You're focusing on that. And I try to tell folks in my own life, try to follow the same advice and counsel. Let's not focus on the problem. Let's focus on the problem solver because the problem solver is always bigger than the problem. So we got to watch out that we're drawing that focus is right on God. The more you focus on Christ and God's love for you and God's goodness, 
then you're, the more you're going to see Christ increase and the, the, the thoughts will be dominant in your mind and will, the more Christ will become visible in your life. But you better watch out. You better watch out because when we endeavor to serve God, not to think that you're the center of the narrative. It's Listen, God can do it with you or without you. Uh, God can reach a city with you or without you. God can build a bus route with you or without you. God can pastor the church with me or without me. It's not about any one of us. It's about all of us recognizing it's all about Him. And God says, step out of the way and let God step in and do a great work that God wants to accomplish in our lives. Hebrews says looking unto Jesus the story is not about us it's about him looking unto Jesus Christ. And then lastly may I say this when Jesus increases we find the true path to greatness in life and ministry when, when we begin to allow him to increase we find the true path of greatness <clears throat> in, in our life and our ministry. John didn't view his own, uh, his own uh, decrease as failure but success. We think in this world, our culture says decrease is bad. Weakness is bad. Decline is bad. Uh, but in God's viewpoint, decrease is increase. And uh, decline is moving forward, follow on as our thing. So whenever people are more drawn to Christ than to us, you've been successful. Whenever folks are more drawn to Christ at your job, they ought to be more drawn to Christ than they are to you. In your home, your family ought to be more drawn to Christ than they are to you. If that's being accomplished in our life, God says, you're a success. You're a success. Well, I was hoping I'd achieve this by this age. I was hoping I'd, I'd be here by this stage of my life. I was hoping I'd be, and there's nothing wrong with having goals, but the true goal of every child of God should be a passion to just step out of the way and say, all I want to do is I just want to point people to Christ. I just want to be a pointer dog for Jesus. And that dog, gun dogs they call them, because they're not spooked by the sound of the gun going off and running down in, you know, down the, 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 in the field somewhere. They hold their place, and their success, their tails are wagging after, not while they're pointing, but after their master has shot that bird that they were pointing at and got that target. That dog, boy, their tail goes a wagon, and they come up to the owner, and boy, you could see the smile on that dog's face. And it was just so exciting as we watched uh, this dog, and, and, uh, and it would go all, and, it was just, and oftentimes we thought it was going to, there's no birds there, there's no birds there. And sure enough, there was one. And uh, we dug it up, or you know, shook it up, and there it went out, flying there, that dog. All the time, he found his success, he found his purpose, and just sing the master. Find what he was looking for, pointing others, pointing others. And he says, I've done my job. He never caught a bird in his whole life. In fact, if he did, he'd get in trouble. Pointer dogs aren't supposed to go catch birds. They're to let the owner catch the bird or shoot the bird. And if they would ever go after a bird, they would be dealt with so they wouldn't do that again. And God says, you know what? Great peace and they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Listen, let's live a life that all you're doing is just pointing people to Jesus Christ. You're unjustly treated, then let others see your response pointing people to Jesus. You were, someone said something unkindly about you, let how you respond be that which points others to Jesus Christ. Yeah, you like to get some off your. Yeah, you like to say. Yeah, you like to say whatever else. But let's be a pointer dog uh, for Jesus Christ. True greatness in life is when we point others to Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was a success, not because all of his following left, but because that's what he came to do. Behold, there he is, the Lamb of God. Look at this is who I've been preaching about. This is who we've been talking about, folks. That's the guy. And they began to leave John the Baptist to go to, to see Jesus and to live life with Jesus. And John the Baptist understood that was his purpose in life. Instead of getting people to focus their attention on us, we should guide them to focus their attention on Jesus Christ. To the degree that we accept the decrease of ourselves, to the degree that we experience the increasing of Christ, God will not be increased in my life other than the extent that I decrease in my life. Let me give you this verse and we're done. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 10. Paul, in this passage of Scripture, is rejoicing in his weakness or in being decreased. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, popular verse. We often use it 
as uh, we try to go through trials and maybe some adversities about the grace of God that comes along to strengthen us and makes us strong in our weaknesses. <clears throat> but look in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> look with me down in verse number, um, oh, let's see, let, let's start in verse number, um, let's, see, let's go down to verse number, um, uh, verse 6. I'm sorry, let's go to verse, verse 9, I'm sorry. And he said to me, oh, let, okay, there, he had a thorn in the flesh. Um, Verse 8, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, they might depart from me. So um, Paul had, a, had a, a, an infirmity. Some think it was a, a speech a, infirmity where he stuttered and, and things of that nature. Others think it was um, an eyesight infirmity. I think through other verses in Scripture, it sort of gives the, the impression that he had some visual uh, type of infirmity where he really couldn't see maybe uh, well. And, and so, But he had this infirmity that limited him. Physically, from being able to serve God, he felt, he thought, Paul did. And so he, he besought the Lord three times, thrice. So he went to God and prayed, God, would you please heal me? I could do so much for, more for you if I could speak well or if I could see well. I could do so much more for you, God. Three times he begged God, he pleaded with God uh, for God to heal him of this, this infirmity, this thorn in the flesh, as he calls it. Notice in verse number uh, 9. And he said, so God said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, verse 10, I take pleasure, Paul says, in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ. He says, man, he's listing all these negative things. He says, I take pleasure in all these things. How come? For when I am weak, then am I strong. And so Paul rejoices in his weakness or in his decreasing. He must increase, we must decrease. And so Paul gladly boasts in weakness because his real goal is what? For the power of Christ to rest upon him. He said, I, I, if, if, I, if my strength is made perfect in weakness, then guess what? During the trials of my life, it's not me that's going to keep a good attitude during a difficult time. It's not me that's going to keep a positive, up, upbeat life, uh, outlook when I'm going through a challenging time. It's a power of Christ that rests upon me. So even the trials of life and the hardships of life, I can point people to Jesus because it's not my strength that's allowing me to make it through this. It's his strength. How in the world can you go through this? It's his strength. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Well, what's perfected strength? It's certainly not my strength. It's God's strength through me pointing others to me. It's not, wow, what a great Christian he is. Look at how strong he is. Look at how positive he is. <laughs> Paul says, I, I glory in my weakness. Why? Because the power of God's strength rests upon me. You see, Paul is well pleased with weakness because weakness is a prerequisite for the display of divine power. When you're weak, then he can show himself strong on your behalf. I like this little thought I saw. Paul's pleased because being a weak canvas, because weak canvases are the only ones that Christ can paint portraits upon. If you're trying to paint your own portrait of what you want your life to be, the focus is going to be on you. But when you're just a weak canvas, God then can paint a masterpiece of what he wants to accomplish in our lives because the focus is on him. Here's the point. The whole message, I'm done. Christ's power will not rest upon Paul unless Paul first provides the backdrop of his own weakness. Christ will not display his power unless weakness is there first. And that's why he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Before he can ever increase in my life, I've got to decrease. I've got to decrease. I've got to see that it isn't about me. It's not about, oh, it's so hard, and boy, it's, oh, life is so tough, and, and, and woe is me. And No, it's not about me. It's about whatever we go through in life. It could be a cloud experience, I mean, a mountaintop experience with these blessings, and wow, that's awesome, and everything else. And it's not about, oh, look at what I've accomplished. It's about, isn't God good? Wow, we're so undeserving of God's goodness in such a way. Or it could be a valley of, of shadow of death that we're going through, a hardship we're going through. 
and we want to point people to Jesus, sure we'll shed tears. Sure we'll be sad. Sure there'll be sorrow in our hearts. But not sorrow with those that have no hope because we want to point people to Jesus Christ. And so you're going through a hard time right now in your life. You're in a spot where your strength can become perfected. What's that mean? Because it's his strength working through you. So it's not you. It's him. How can, you, how can you stay that way? How do you keep so focused? How do you keep staying involved? How do you keep serving God? How do you keep doing what you do? Uh, listen, Christ will only display his power when we display our weakness. He says, I, I've got to decrease. So what's that mean? God says, you've got to get out of the way and let God get in the forefront. Let God. You're just a, a mouthpiece. You're just a forward, just a. It's all about him. And when God shows up in your life, let God get all the attention. Let God get all the focus. Let, let it be about God. It's not about us. I'll tell you what, there won't be hurt feelings. There won't be offenses. There won't be jealousy. There won't be envy. There won't be contention. There won't be strife. There won't be jockeying for positions. Why? It's not, we're a team. And our goal as a team is what? We want to point people to Jesus. And if, it, if it's uh, sister so-and-so being able to point someone to Jesus Christ instead of me pointing them to Christ, that doesn't matter. I'm glad they're pointing to Christ. That's what we're here for. If it's Brother Sam on a bus route allowing to point someone to Christ and not you pointing them to Christ, then praise the Lord. I'm not going to get upset. That's the purpose of our church, to point people to Jesus. If it's me or someone else, it doesn't matter because it's all about Christ. And someone else and we as a team rejoice and say, hey, what a game we had. What a day we had. Well, I didn't see anybody saved out so him, but we saw three. And praise God, God saved three. Isn't that wonderful? But I didn't see any, but it's not about you it's about him and together we're able to see the greatness of God the purpose of God accomplished a pointer dog for Jesus just a pointer dog and they find fulfillment in their life never by capturing anything or getting the attention for anything the the, the man come, the owner comes back with it we had our string of birds we had them on the back of the tailgate didn't we brother Nathan and we had them laid out there and they were all stretched out and our pheasants and our quail and we had them there and the dogs they were out running around they were having a great time uh, but where was the fo- that, no dog was in the picture it was us holding our, 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 our stream of you know birds and a uh, thing that we had there it was all about us getting the birds oh wouldn't that be a change if it was just all about, it's about Jesus. And it's not about, well, why didn't, why didn't anything happen to me? Why didn't I get any credit or friend? Listen, it's not about us. It's about him. And, uh, and his job was what? Through him, he came to bear witness of the light. And that's what he wants to do in your life. life. He wants to go through you so he'll bear witness of Christ. Are others being pointed to Christ because of you? Your work ethic, it should point others to Christ. Your, your upbeat attitude, spirit, should point folks to Christ. Your, your countenance and smile and uh, interaction with people should point people to Christ. And uh, your, your love for God and your love for people should point people to Christ. Listen, every area of your life, it should just point people to Christ. Like, wow, you're, there's something different about you. There's something different about you. And uh, no, it's not, it's not something about me that's different. It's Christ in me. Anything you see in me that's different, it's Jesus Christ that's made the difference in my life. He gets all the credit. He gets all the glory. He gets all the praise. Father, help us tonight.